Hello everyone, my name is Antoine Gallard, I'm the Associate Director of the Nature Conservation Center. Uh, on behalf of our director, Dr. Orlando, and the entire UDNCC team, I wanted to thank IFI to thank the partners who made this panel happen. Uh, I specifically want to thank uh, Carol and Mark Ayou, who played a big role in designing uh, the discussion we're about to, uh, to attend. Uh, so this panel is part of a series of roundtables uh, called Navigating Climate Change and Environmental Activism in the MENA Region, Challenges and Opportunities. The next panel is going to be held on June 5th, and it's going to be about environmental activism in Lebanon. And uh, now we're going to hear from Yara Murad, the Assistant Director of the IRI, She also leads the program on refugees uh, research and policy. Thank you all. Uh, we're very happy to be collaborating with the Nature Conservation Center on this panel, which is a part of a series of panels, as Antoine just mentioned. And today's panel, specifically um, titled Environmental and Policy Implication for Solar Energy, is very timely and relevant, given the different incidents and discussions that are happening in Lebanon and the region. Um, one of the primary consequences of Lebanon's financial meltdown, as we all know, has been the deterioration of governmental services, and one of which is the energy sector. And today, as you see that public electricity has been reduced to very few hours per day, many households and businesses have opted to invest in solar energy. However, the government does not have a national strategy for that. So it makes us wonder how is this all going to be um, managed and organized. Today's event with our stellar panel that we have today will offer some expert insights on the impacts of this movement towards solar energy use, as well as how we can have different actors contribute to fulfilling the full potential of this trend that we see. I want to thank you again, Antoine, and I thank Orlando of NCC for this collaboration. And as an institute, we look forward to working together in producing rich evidence-based research on such relevant topics, which our institute is also working on as part of the climate change and environment program and energy program here. And more importantly, transforming this research that we have into policy making, not just in Lebanon, but the region as well. I'd like to welcome our uh, esteemed panelists here and our moderator. Uh, moderating today's uh, session is Carol Ayat. Um, Carol is an energy finance professional and investment banker. She's been deeply involved in policy discussions around the energy sector in Lebanon with various stakeholders, including the local administration, the international financing community, and the international developers and manufacturers. And we're very proud to have Carol as well as an associate fellow of the Institute. So, Carol, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Yara. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, Lebanon has witnessed one of the highest deployment of distributed solar energy during the crisis. Imports of PV panels alone through the port have accumulated to more than 100,000 tons since 2013, out of which 80% alone were in 2022. According to the LCEC, gross capacity installed reached almost 1 gigawatt as at end of 2022 representing a tenfold increase, ten times since the year end 2019. The cost of solar technology has dropped by more than 90% over the last 10 years. And despite the global supply chain issues, where we've seen an increase of 12 to 13% in prices last year, deployment accelerated in Lebanon. And alone in 2022, the LCEC estimates that 663 megawatts were installed driven by the low LCOE levelized cost of electricity of solar energy compared to fossil fuels. In fact, the higher the oil prices, the faster the payback period for solar. The surge represents an investment by the private sector estimated at 800 million during the crisis. And this is funded mostly by private cap capital given the absence of proper financing schemes and the banking sector. This rapid scale-up, one of the fastest globally, especially when we compare it per capita, outpaced the ability of the government, 
who was in crisis as well, to propose the proper regulation and oversight, environmental, urban planning, standards, qualification, and also outpace some of the private companies' capacity to uh, have the proper teams, engineers, and capacity uh, to deal with this huge demand. And in some cases, this has led to bad customer experience, which could damage the reputation of the sector. To discuss this mat these matters, as well as the, f uh, as the future of the solar energy sector in Lebanon, I am pleased to be moderating this uh, exciting panel today, which includes uh, experts from various fields, all related to the solar industry, started with, uh, starting with Mr. Bahakin Kabakian, a climate change policy and finance advisor at the UNDP and the Ministry of Environment. Bahakin has contributed in setting Lebanon's NDCs, the nationally determined contributions as per the Paris Agreement. He's contributed in the study of the UNDP called De-Risking uh, Renewable Investments in Lebanon and in designing the Lebanon Green Investment Facility. Uh, next, Maître Soraya Nashnou, who is a partner with Abu Jaldi Law Firm and co-heads their energy practice. Soraya has extensive experience dealing with the energy sector in Lebanon she has had a first-hand uh, experience in designing and working on Lebanon's uh, first PPA, which is the wind farms, and on the solar PPAs, as well as multiple other projects related to the energy sector. Uh, next, we have Mr. Pierre Khoury, who is the president of the Lebanese Center for Energy Conservation, the SCEC. Under Pierre's leadership, the SCEC has launched many projects in renewable energy, uh, including the wind IPPs, the solar IPPs, and multiple expressions of interest that were launched in wind, solar and batteries, hydro, uh, and others. He's also worked on public policy, including designing uh, the first distributed renewable energy law, the energy efficiency law, and other public policy matters as well. And next we have Mr. Khalifi Nizdi who heads the uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the EBRD, in Lebanon. The EBRD is one of the most active DFIs supporting the energy transition in Lebanon and worldwide. They have assisted the government in the PPA bankability reviews on the DRE law, the Distributed Renewable Energy law, and are currently working closely also with the private sector to try to find solutions related to energy security, amongst others. Last but not least, uh, we have Mrs. Dalia Zbelde. Dalia is the Vice President of the AUB National Conservation Center. She is a, a, a recently a board member of the RDCL, a member of the Board of Directors at the Jubaile Brothers Holding, a global energy provider, established in 1977 in Lebanon. As of today, Jubaile Bros provides energy in 18 countries, with more than 1,500 employees, and they have installed more than 20 gigawatt of power globally, uh, and more than 4 megawatt of solar in Lebanon. So welcome, and thank you for being part of uh, this panel today. Daya, I'll start with you. You are the manager of a prominent energy solution company in Lebanon, as you like to describe it. Can you please give us some color on your experience related to the surge in solar energy in Lebanon. I know that you've performed an audit on systems, especially systems with problems that have been oftentimes installed by unqualified companies. What were the main issues and results of this study? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so first of all, uh, in Lebanon, due to the lack of electricity, the high cost of private generators, the uncertainty of the fuel and its prices, uh, everybody wanted to solar. There was a high demand in a very short period. Many professional solar systems has been installed. At the same time, less qualified components have flooded the market. We were approached by many customers to check on the solar system that was not working. Uh, in Jubaili Bros, we launched to offer free inspection for all such cases. For us to understand the market, and to better, uh, to ensure that there's more proper solar uh, installation or reputation uh, for Lebanon in the installations. From the cases that we have collected, uh, I would like to share with you the results. So 12% were actually due to the inverters, whether it's a bad quality or no technical compliance as per the application. 22% uh, 
was due to the wrong wiring and connection, 25% was due to wrong installation, and the highest number, 40%, was due to the battery problems. And here I would like to highlight, other than the impact of the environment, the cost of the battery is around 40 to 60% of the solar system, and that is a sunk cost on the customer. <laughs> Here it's important to highlight that the big demand for solar was not accompanied by solar expertise available to support this, the companies. Some companies got new resources, they were not trained enough or they didn't have the supervision to ensure the quality of the systems. Since solar is the future energy for Lebanon, it is important for the schools, the institutions and the universities to adopt the renewable energy in their curriculum. As Jubaili, we feel responsible to create awareness to educate our consumers to select the right solution for their power needs. Therefore, we are embarking on multiple initiatives. At the same time, we enriched our team with an experienced and professional Chief Renewable Energy Officer who has installed in the last 15 years in more than 26 countries 1.5 gigawatt power, which exceeds four times the existing installation in Lebanon. We're looking forward to work with them in order to explore better opportunities in Lebanon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dalia. We're going to definitely delve into more of the initiatives that you're doing to spread awareness uh, in the next questions. But I'd like to move to Pierre and following up on what Dalia was saying. Uh, we know that regarding the Banque de la Vita, Banque de scale, the solar loans that they were granting, the LCC had a list of pre-approved companies that you've vetted, that maybe you know, they have the qualifications uh, needed to, to be a solar, uh, solar in Lebanon. Are there any other certain similar initiatives that you're doing on a nationwide to protect the general public, not necessarily those that are only benefiting from those solar loans from Banque de la Vita by uh, auditing some companies, publishing a list of Is there somewhere where consumers can go and check whether the company they're dealing with has the proper qualifications? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, let me start by going back to the introduction. Uh, just to, to start as a strategic level, and then we can take the issue of quality at the specific case. Uh, at the strategic level, honestly, it's really unfair to say that the Lebanese government doesn't have a vision in the field of renewable energy. No, to be honest, the Lebanese government, through its different ministries, administrations, and institutions, had and still have a vision. The government has a strategy and it has an action plan that is regularly updated. Uh, and what do I mean by this? I s it simply means that when the then Prime Minister, Saad Harid in 2009, uh, committed to reach 12% of renewable energy by 2020 at the Copenhagen summit uh, in Denmark, uh, this commitment was translated in all the correspondences, in all the action plans, in all the literature that the Lebanese government through different administrations and ministries used to do. And then the uh, construction of new solar power plants, new wind farms, the adoption of mandatory standards for products imported, all these are part of the ministry strategy and the ministry action plan. So this is to say that it's really unfair to say that the government doesn't have a vision, a strategy, an action plan. No, it does have this. And practically, the third that we're witnessing today is a direct result of the cumulative actions that were taken. And let's go into one specific example, which is the example of standards. The, through, uh, or between the period 2010 and 2020, we know the Lebanese Standard Institution has adopted more than 37 standards that have to do with solar power. And all these standards are mandatory uh, according to decision by the Council of Ministers. And this was already in place when this 2021-2022 surge uh, took place. So the market was ready, the uh, Lebanese customs were ready to stop any product to be imported uh, and ignore as the, the standards were mandatory. The Industrial Research Institute had the testing labs to test the products according to standards. So there's the there's a whole value chain that existed during the period. The missing part of the puzzle was to remove subsidies on tariffs. And I think this is the main triggering point that created this surge that reached 663 megawatts in 2022. That was the uh, main uh, missing part of the puzzle, removal of subsidies. And it did happen 
in 2021-2022. So to, to, to make it short, now consumers are protected through the import of products at the Lenin border, yeah, seaport or airport. Uh, the companies are being qualified for SECs. There are two types of qualification, one for small installation and the other one for bigger installations. Thank you, Pierre. So right now, is there a list of, of qualified companies that people can check, or is it just through the supply of equipment that consumers are indirectly uh, in, in fact, there are two lists. One which is developed in partnership with Bank de la Vitale, if it scans the housing bank. And this one includes around 52 companies. And these 52 companies are mainly specialized or are qualified according to criteria. Uh, for smaller installation, and then now we have another list which includes companies that are able to install systems bigger than 250 uh, kilowatt. And this second list will be used by many donors, and it will be adopted by donors in the implementation of the big projects. And my last follow-up question, Pierre: When did the big NOR and the IRI uh, standards start being implemented? So did we have 2007 a through a Greek donation at the IRI. 2010, 2012, 2014, 2015, 16, 17, and the adoption of the biggest number of standards as mandated by the Advisory Council of Minister was done in 2017. Thank you. Well, I can, can uh, I ask you just anecdotally, we've heard stories about farmers in the big following the installations of solar pumps because the energy became free, became from the sun, pumping much more water than they needed for the irrigation of their land and starting to trade the water via uh, the trucks, the water trucks. This is an example where without maybe regulation beyond just energy, you know, how could solar impact other sectors uh, and have repercussions. What are some of the recommendations that you have or best practices that should be followed to avoid similar arbitrage or issues in the future related to food, water security, waste, and others? Okay. Um, thanks, Carol. Um, th thanks for having me. Um, well, first, I completely agree. This is not an energy issue um, or regulation related to the energy sector. So it's, it's a typical where um, suddenly something for free is, is available um, as a source, in this case electricity, and then it's used for um, trading water. Um, but then that's a, that's a different issue where you have, uh, and I'll touch upon that towards the end of my intervention, um, but that has to do with the um, agriculture and the water management um, segment of, of the sector. Um, which, in a way, it would be unfair to say, don't install the water pump so that we don't end up using, um, or abusing, in this case, the water resources. Um, but I'll come to that as a, as a general remark toward the end. Um, as a series of recommendations, I think the, um, one of the attempts that, uh, that, were, that was done was the Strategic Environment Assessment for the Renewable Sector. And that's in 2014. Um, where, depending on the technology, um, a set of recommendations were, 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 um, were given out. Obviously, um, uh, one is water, uh, but more importantly, when it comes to PV, um, or solar in this case, is the trade-off between um, land use in this case. So instead of, you know, you can, you can have a high-value crop land um, being converted into a PV, um, um, a PV farm. Obviously, this is very relevant if we're talking about the large installations rather than the small ones. So obviously, one recommendation is to make sure that that shift doesn't happen, uh, or if, if it is happening, um, um, it is justified. Um, you know, one way could be a cost-benefit analysis, for example, um, beyond the project. Um, Biodiversity-wise, sometimes depending on where um, when the installation is, where, where the farm is, again, we're talking about large installations. Um, again, it depends how sensitive the area is, uh, if there's fencing around it or not. So these are all um, small elements that need to be taken into, into account um, when designing um, um, the, the farm um, specific, um, specific on, on identified locations. Third, waste. Um, I mean, I just heard your one gigawatt um, um, number. 
Um, well, still, you know, this is this is the number that we have, um, and I'm not doubting the number. Uh, but I did a quick calculation because I had the numbers of um, potential PV waste based on the mono uh, crystalline uh, silicon uh, technology. Um, if it is one gigawatt, then we're we're expecting a good um, 100,000 tons of PV panels, and that's only the panel. So I'm not talking about um, the invert the BOS, right, so the balance of the system. And if this is 100% coupled with lead acid battery, then we're looking at, I think, let me just check, yeah, around 90,000 tons of uh, lead acid battery. Um, that's a lot of wastes, I agree. No way. Um, well, no way the number or no way the <laughs> one gigawatt. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I, I need to know the, the reaction yeah, somewhat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 but I'm just saying, I'm, I'm saying if you couple the one gigawatt, assume that it has kilom lead acid batteries. That's an exaggeration, which is not the case, obviously, but just to give you the scale uh, of what could happen. Uh, now, for PV in general, um, there's a lot of recover, potential of recovering the materials. Uh, not 100%, but good element of, of those uh, can be recovered. <clears throat> we don't have that. Uh, but we do have recovery taking place for lead acid batteries. Lithium, that's again a different, uh, different topic, a different topic. But in general, um, within the lifetime, so we need to also take into account the lifetime of those um, installations. Um, um, we still have some time, right? So we're not gonna throw the one, the one gigawatt tomorrow. Uh, we're looking at 20, 25 years ahead. So um, either there needs to come in as a, a strategy and what to do with these, uh, which could also include perhaps a local um, factory that recycles these. Uh, that could be perhaps, you know, try to benefit the region as well, not, not just have the, the level of the So if I can uh, understand, so for the PV panels, maybe we have time, but uh, it doesn't hurt to start. But for the batteries, right. it may be a different element. Some batteries have three years, five years, Absolutely. seven, the inverter, 10 years. So maybe uh, more cooperation to develop some type of recycling policy may be needed, uh, as well with the LCEC and others. And on the other topics, more collaboration maybe with other ministries. And that brings to my final point that I, wa I wanted to, to sort of, uh, um, um, yeah, you know, uh, bring it, you know, prepare to that. It is not a single ministry work. Um, so again, pointing out for the Minister of Energy, um, or even as you see sometimes, it's not a one single ministry thing. Water is Minister of Energy to water, agriculture, um, solid waste issues, you have the CDR, you have the Minister of Environment, you have the Minister of Interior and Municipalities. So it's a wider government uh, effort that needs to be set up. Thank you, Bank. Suraya? A question regarding laws, right? What are the current laws legislating all this installation of solar power? So, you know, they're going back to the basics. I'm a company today. I want to install for my own consumption. How much can I install? Can I sell to my neighbor? What can I do? Uh, what are the permits and licenses that, you know, I may need? Can you can you give us some color on that? Of course, happy to. Uh, thank you so much again. And, uh, um, I know the LCC had a lot of fun in the past uh, year answering these questions. What can I do and can I sell to my neighbor? Because that seems to be the number one question in, uh, in the field. Um, so I would say there are four main legislative texts um, that, that impact, and one of them hopefully will impact um, this sector and that govern today the installation of of solar panels by private parties. The, the first law is the law that established EDL that was uh, uh, enacted in 1964. That law, ironically, although it dates back to that long ago, actually provides for the ability, as opposed to the monopoly that is with EDL for the production, transmission, and distribution of electricity, they carve out one exception related to the generation of electricity for personal use. So this 
actual term was back then in 1964 provided for. And, and um, the limitation to that exception is, of course, not to sell that energy or to distribute it to, to somebody else. Uh, then came the law of uh, 462 of 2002, which also provided explicitly, obviously, for the establishment of the ERA, uh, but also in a particular provision, it provided that the generation of power below 1.5 <coughs> megawatts is uh, free in the sense where it, it's un legally unrestricted, it doesn't require a permit, it doesn't require a planning permit either. You can do so as long as you're installing the solar panels on your own premises and for your personal use. Um, the second threshold is between 1.5 and 10 megawatts. And the law 462 provides that you can do so subject to a permission from the ERA. The third threshold, which is above 10 megawatts, uh, it is also uh, accounted for in the law, but it provides that in order to do so, in order to generate uh, that capacity, you need a permit, which is a, a more bureaucratically complex form of approval from the ERA. Now, since the ERA does not yet exist, what is happening in the meantime, or what we could consider to be happening, is that under 1.5 is obviously, this is what's been, what we've been talking about since the beginning of the session. Between 1.5 and 10, which would normally be within the prerogatives of uh, the ERA, uh, today we can consider that the Council of Ministers can replace the uh, ERA in providing that permit, provided that the Council of Ministers itself, under Law 288 of 2014, which has been extended many times, still has the authority to accept the exceptional authority to, to grant um, generation licenses to private parties. Now that law of 288 has been extended in 2014 and subsequently 15, 19. The cutoff date for the, this authority with the Council of Ministers is 30 April 2022. There has not been an extension since then, but from our experience we expect that there will be another extension pending the establishment of the of the ERA. So I would say these are the three laws that exist that govern this uh, uh, this type of installation by private parties. There is obviously the draft uh, renewable energy uh, distributed renewable energy law, which uh, I'm sure Pierre will will broach on as he's, he's been a main component in uh, its. Uh, hopeful existence. It was uh, approved by the Council of Ministers in March of 2022. It has not yet been uh, passed by uh, Parliament. It sets mainly the legal foundations for peer-to-peer -peer distributed energy contracts and a special form of net metering for on-site and off-site power purchase agreements and the leasing of renewable energy instruments. So that's where we are today. Thank you, Suleya. And Khalil, I know the EBRD had worked extensively alongside the LCEC on the slow, the distributed renewable energy, because beyond the 1.5 megawatt that today is permitted, that law will permit up to 10 megawatts installations. As uh, Surya was saying, also peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, net metering, power wheeling, and others. So this law is currently awaiting legislation at Parliament. Can you kind of comment on the importance of the slow? And does it make sense to pass it now, given that ODL is in full, full, um, near full collapse? The grid, you know, if it's not functioning, it's very hard to do net metering or to do peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. So can you comment on that? Uh, First of all, I would like to do things very quickly. One, to apologize for being late to all of you, including the audience and my co-panelists, but I still underestimate the time between uh, downtown and AUB. 35 minutes for me was an extension, but anyways, sorry for that. And to, of course, to thank you for the kind invitation at IFI, and I'm very happy to be here again. Now, uh, on your question. Um, actually, we, indeed, at the EBRD, I think it was back in 2019 that we teamed up with the LCEC and the Ministry of Energy and Water in general. Uh, we hired uh, technical and legal advisors, and we supported the drafting of this very important law. It has been a long road. Um, indeed, as Soleil was saying, it was um, approved by Council of Ministers. 
And then we had a kind of a long debate at Parliament. I had the joy to go together with Pierre to Parliament to defend it at committee. Uh, we thought that it was a no-brainer. We thought that it was really uh, consensual. We thought that it should uh, fly very quickly. It was not the case. Uh, it became a little bit political at some point. Uh, it was important for us to make sure that it is not an EBRT law, as uh, some of the MPs called it, but it is a law uh, of the government and the Republic of Lebanon. And we still believe, despite the amendments that have been through uh, the text, that this is a key law uh, and a key piece of law for the future. Uh, as Raya was, uh, was describing, it, uh, it will enable peer-to-peer -peer trading, it will enable power wheeling, uh, the corporate on-site and off-site PPAs. This is extremely important to make sure that we have a solid regulatory framework for all what we have, we have been seen already in uh, towns and villages uh, and to make sure that this is regulated. ERA is also a very important piece of this. But to answer specifically your question, Carol, on, on the timing, uh, I think more than ever time is of an essence and more than ever uh, now that is uh, at Parliament for, I don't know, six months already, we need it approved as soon as possible. But the reason for that is that it will not be applicable the minute the, the Parliament approve it. We will have to go through a number of next steps, including potentially decrease of applications. But more importantly, uh, some key stakeholders will need to be ready to deploy it, including EDF, including electricity people. And it is very important uh, to make sure that EDL is ready to deploy it, both uh, technically, I think uh, the grid needs some maintenance, and I'm looking to Pierre because I, we discussed this many times, including with, with, um, uh, with EDL themselves. Uh, it, it needs also some technical assistance at EDL level, in terms of software, in terms of know-how, so we're not there yet. But for us to be able to deploy the second phase, uh, we need to have approval of Parliament. And here, one last point to highlight, which is, I think, interesting, is also the coordination between the international financial institutions. Uh, I understand from colleagues from the World Bank, this is still work in progress, uh, but they have already communicated on it. They will provide such a, a support to EDM, both on the technical assistance and on the green maintenance. So there is a good sequence between the support of the EBR, EBRT and, therefore, the, the World Bank. Thank you, Khalil. And also, this highlights the point of how the energy ecosystem is all interrelated. We cannot talk about scaling up renewables very massively without fixing the grid, without fixing EDN, without implementing reforms. So really, this is a coordinated approach that needs to take place so that Lebanon really fulfills its full potential, which is huge in renewable energy. Yeah. Uh, Dalia, going back to you. We, uh, we discussed and we briefly touched on the inability maybe of the government because of the crisis, its lack of resources to really accompany this huge surge that has happened and maybe some of the policies that we're talking about recycling and others will have to happen <coughs> post fact. What is the private sector role in your opinion? Do you have a role to play in you know, bringing awareness, helping municipalities, consumers and others understand and, uh, and uh, really avoid some of the pitfalls that you mentioned regarding distributed solar energy. So again, we uh, at Jubaydi Plus, being part of, the, of our communities, uh, we took on many initiatives. So first of all, we offered a prototype for solar for the institutions to aid the technicians of learning about the solar systems. Uh, second, in collaboration with AUB Engineering, we sponsored a competition for the students to come up with innovative solution to tackle the, spaces, the space limit that we have in most of our cities. Uh, third of all, we created a team, we went, to the, we went to the municipalities in order to create awareness for the citizens, for us to tackle the right choice of components technically based on the application, the best environment for the batteries and the inverter, otherwise this is why there's a lot of fire going there, here and there, the applicable wiring and connection, the best structure design based on the wind analysis and the roof type, and this is why we see flying panels during the winter, and preventive maintenance for the panel cleaning, and in order to know how to respond to emergency solutions, which we did this winter. 
This will help the citizens to be aware ahead of time, even if they have installed a system or they want to install, just to be aware what to buy, how to install, and to ensure everything is done properly. Uh, last but not least, I'm happy to announce that Jubaili Bros supported AVNCC in order to create a solar awareness guidance with proper design calculation. This can be used as a reference for the citizens uh, for them to have a safe and proper installation. This guidance, uh, guidance should be launched very soon. Thank you. Uh, as a follow-up question to that, some of my, many of my clients that have installed solar, their main issues that they're facing is always with the integration or with the generators. Mm -hmm. uh, because many of them have to keep the generator running, cannot be fully off-grid and independent. You position your company as an energy solution provider because you don't only look at solar. Can you also give us some colors so that people that are listening as well are aware of these issues? of maybe sizing issues, sizing ratios between generator and, and then how it's, it has to be a bespoke solution that is uh, designed? Sure. So first of all, if I can take it a step before. So we want to be, uh, as energy advisors, it's important to understand the customer power needs, not to build a solar based on their current uh, capacity. So this is where it's important to see, can they lower their consumption? Because end of the day, what they are consuming today doesn't have to be the one where the solar has to be installed. It can be actually, there are unneeded power in that. So once we understand what is the right consumption that is required, not that's available, then we can see what are the customer needs to understand them. And accordingly, we can suggest a solution, I would say. It's not a generator or a solar, it's an energy solution. Some people, for example, have issues with the operating cost and they want solar, but they don't have the capital. Other people, so everybody has his own issues, and this is why it's important to understand in order to uh, to give to, to propose the solution. Uh, I'd like to point out, solar now is more as a complementary, not a substitution of a generator. It, we still do need to run on a generation generator, unless there's a right load management. Then, if the people do the load management in the right way, they might be able to. Um, they won't need a generator, and in many cases they are reducing their generator size. So this is why we have to understand, for example, I'll just give an example. It's not only important to install a solar system, it's important to monitor in the coming few months that we are benefiting from the solar. A few suggestions given to a factory was that they were taking break from one to two. This is the highest peak of the sun during the day. So if they shift this hour, imagine how many loads can be used during this hour. So there's multiple things that can be taken into consideration in order to consider proper load management and to benefit from the free uh, renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. Uh, so maybe you've highlighted on a very important point, which is energy efficiency. And that's another thing as well that we've witnessed during the crisis with the removal of subsidies. When people have to pay for something, they you know, care about how they're consuming it. And that brings me to another law as well, uh, Pierre, that you worked on, the energy efficiency law. Can you comment on this, where it stands? What would it bring to this uh, sector in terms of better performance and uh, better standards and practices? Uh, in fact, the energy efficiency law was again approved by the Council of Ministers in, I think, March 2022. Uh, it was passed to the, to the Parliament. Now it's under discussion at the level of the Energy Committee of the Parliament. Uh, to be honest, it's going to be another long uh, path with the Energy Committee. For the DRE law, probably I, I, I participated in around 19 <coughs> meetings of the Energy Committee, at the end of which the DRE law was approved by the Committee, now it's at the level of the Finance Committee. And I don't, we don't believe there will be any comment at the level of the Finance Committee. For once you have, hopefully, the President of the Republic, once you have an active Parliament, Law will be passed, so we're hopeful about this. However, with the energy efficiency law, it's more complicated because it does deal with different applications of energy efficiency. It deals with energy efficiency in the 
transportation sector, so the Ministry of Transport and Public Works needs to be involved. This has to do with energy efficiency in uh, urban planning, so the higher directorate of urban planning needs to be involved, and so on. So there are a lot of players who are involved in the development of the EE law, the energy efficiency law, and then it will take some time, but we are again hopeful that at the end of the tunnel there will be a light and it will pass. Now regarding the role of energy efficiency, again it's interesting to note that according to some estimations and calculations that we have done at LCEC, the national demand in Lebanon has decreased by something between 40 and 50 percent, which is enormous in a small country like that. It's really, uh, it's crazy. So the numbers that we're witnessing today, I mean, before 2019 and after 2022, you know, the overall picture has drastically changed. And the approach to this new situation, we need to have a new approach. We need to look at things in a very different way. But it's really interesting to, to see that the demand has decreased by 50%, which simply makes uh, we have a new reality, which says that the existing power plants of EDL today, if they are operated in a efficient and, and well, if they are well maintained, together with the solar installations, we don't I don't see any more a reason for brown house and black house. It's a new reality. We have definitely to dig further into that to see how things are working. But I think we are in front of a new reality at the end of the sector. Thank you, Pierre. We actually uh, also uh, had a study published with the IFI a few months ago called Re Energize Lebanon that tackled exactly this point. When you're designing today an energy policy, you need to understand the market. What is the demand? Well, we believe there's uh, definitely a reduction in demand due to energy efficiency, more energy awareness, etc. But there's also something what we call suppressed demand. People that don't have access to electricity due to unaffordability. Uh, therefore, despite the 50% drop in consumption, which we call compressed consumption, uh, which is suppressed consumption, we estimate that demand is probably going to drop in line with the contraction of real GDP of 25-30, making definitely a revisiting of the least cost generation plan and the energy mix of Lebanon necessary, given this new reality. Uh, uh, if you allow me to add to this, I think the needed research at this stage today in Lebanon is to see what is the percentage of suppressed demand versus the percentage of actual energy efficiency due to change in behavior. I think this is an extremely needed uh, study. There is also, to add, a third element, which is decreased due to the drop in GDP and drop in economic activity. So three elements need to be segregated. But definitely the numbers, at least on the imports of diesel, corroborate, corroborate with your numbers that 50-60% drop in consumption, but definitely uh, once the conditions are normalized, uh, we should assume uh, some kind of recovery of demand somewhere around 20-30% below where it was. Uh, now, Bahaken, uh, going back to you, you've worked on setting Lebanon national determined contributions, whereas the government has set targets unconditionally to reduce CO2 emissions by 20% in 2030. Given this surge in solar, where are we on meeting this target? Noting that maybe the heavier use following the collapse of EDL of generator may have offset or more than offset some of uh, the benefits of the solar. What are your thoughts on this? Right, so um, maybe I should highlight a bit what unconditional means in this case, uh, in Lebanon's case, because it's a bit different than other countries. Um, so when Lebanon was really working on this update in 2020, um, so the word unconditional means that um, any support, instrumental support, that comes from MDBs, IFIs, um, that are non-grant instruments, so in principle we're paying it back, as part of the unconditional. So just, just to put that out, it's not just, you know, when, when um, it's only on you know, the government budget who's covering um, um, the, the cost of meeting that target. Um, so going back to your question, and I think, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm gonna bring in a number. So um, in terms of a kilowatt hour delivered, um, generators, um, and I'm only talking about carbon dioxide in this case, so don't, don't take it for, for other um, 
or for, for air pollutants in this case. Um, it only emits 6% more than um, the national grid. And that doesn't mean that the generators are clean. It means our grid is really dirty. So it's the opposite of the grid. Um, um, so you have, to, you have to really think about what type of fuel we use in the power plants, which is dirtier than the diesel that we use in generators. And you need to factor in um, the transmission losses to get to, get to that one kilowatt hour deliver. So um, had we completely converted 24-7 um, from EDL to generators, we would have had, so no renewable, we would have had 6% increase uh, in terms of CO2 emission. So this is one, one number to retain. But with the huge number, obviously, that we're seeing, which obviously goes beyond that 6% potential increase, um, the impact of the renewables is definitely there. Put aside, you know, if we have problems in terms of quality and so on and so forth, um, we will face those going forward. Um, but that's also across all sectors in Lebanon. It's not one particular or the renewable sector. Um, so that's one. The two is um, definitely we're getting closer to the 20%. Um, but also, um, if you really compare the time um, or the amount of electricity generated per day from the generators versus before the crisis, um, that's also less than it was before. Um, we all remember, right, before the crisis, between EDL and generators, we all had 24-hour, more or less, electricity. Generator, EDL, different portions depending where you lived. Now, obviously, we don't have 24-7, and we still have areas that the generators don't provide you the 24-7. So as an aggregate number, the emission is going down. Now, and the most important lesson to keep in mind is, when you have an economic depression, and where you have demand, which is dropping, not because of energy efficiency, actions taking place, and that's what Pierre is saying, we need to differentiate that number. From the convention perspective, this is called hot air. That reduction is not because of an effort we did, it's just because we have an economic depression. And we definitely need that study here. Yes. You know, we need to literally say, this is because this suppression, this reduction is non-effort based, and this is the effort based. So we look forward to seeing all these studies, lots of studies on the table that need to be uh, prepared. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just to kind of finalize and, uh, the circuit on, on the distributed angle and then we'll move to more the utility scale. But just uh, in terms of uh, distributed solar energy and despite the lack of legislation permitting the sale of electricity from peer to peer, we're seeing some companies do developer work, meaning they enter into long-term contract whereby the client doesn't pay the cost of the system, but pays an annual fee, akin or very similar to the payment of a purchase of electricity via different structures. Can you elaborate on these legal structures, these legal maybe work around the law that would allow a company to install and send electricity via a different legal mechanism? 100%. We're, we're witnessing a lot of that. Um, this is not particularly regulated as a type of contract. Um, and it is a workaround because this is not considered to be a straightforward sale. And the solar panels are, even in, in that scenario, which is more often than not um, routed through a lease to own legal structure, whereby a company installs the solar panels on the private property of uh, an individual or, or another <coughs> company and basically take, handles everything up to, uh, you know, including the maintenance, etc. And they sell, quote unquote, that, uh, that electricity. But in fact, it's framed legally in the type of contracts that we've had the uh, opportunity to, to advise on uh, as, as an annual fee or a monthly fee or what have you. And the least-owned aspect of it is that after a certain period of time, 
those solar panels become the own, become the property of the owner of the, pro of the actual property where they are being installed. And this is, I think, the most, the most frequent model we're seeing. It's really borderline legal because there's no, you know, there, there's no direct sale, but at the same time, everything that, all the requirements that are under the law in terms of personal use and installation on private property are met. So I think, you know, I don't believe that there's a need to over-regulate this aspect because this is just, I think, an interim solution pending the uh, enactment of the distributed and, renewable and energy law. Is the company protected in case there's non-payment and at the end the solar panels are installed on the roof of a third party? Well, what, what, we've, seen, what we've seen so far is that the companies have sought to, to get collateral, and you're, you're the expert in that, but they, they've sought to get collateral from those uh, uh, private parties. When they are individuals, the collateral really ranges from the most banal, non-energy related thing to a personal guarantee. When it's a company, it's basically collateralized like a loan. And, and that's, that's what they're, they're seeking to do. Thank you so much for this. Khalid, uh, going back to you, uh, you know, at the end, to reach the 30% goal of renewable energy by 2030, we're going to need one of those, those bigger farms, right? The 800, the 500 megawatts, the 200, and others, which are done in PPP with the government, whereby the private sector sells electricity to the government as a counterpart. And we all know how the crisis has impacted the credit worthiness of the government as an off-taker, and also any other liquidity support that the government was able to provide through its central bank and others. We know that the EBRD being, again, proactive, trying to support this sector. You've been working on some credit enhancement tools. Can you elaborate on some of those ideas that you've been discussing? And what is the timing on those? When do you envisage that they can be put in place? to be able to uh, de-risk a bit those projects? Indeed, we, we believe at the EBRD that um, the credit worthiness of labor today is at stake. We all know it, unfortunately. So we definitely need, in order to promote this very high potential for larger scale renewable energy projects, to add a component that is called credit enhancement mechanism. And here again, it's a, a very uh, coordinated, hand-in-hand uh, -hand approach with the LCEC, as we always do. Uh, and we have started also in um, drafting, and we are actually quite advanced. What is this credit enhancement mechanism? Actually, we are dealing with mainly two things, which are the convertibility, convertibility and the transferability of future cash flows linked to larger scale renewable energy projects. And what we are saying today is that EDL, and therefore the government of Lebanon, as an off-taker, its sovereign uh, signature is weak today and will unfortunately most probably remain weak after, even after reforms are implemented and even after IMF program. So to uh, increase the bankability of such future projects and increase the appetite of international large developers to come to Lebanon, and to invest in Lebanon, we are uh, putting in place this mechanism by which we are protecting these investors with different layers. The first one is within the PPA itself, which is um, a, um, a, a, an account collection mechanism. Uh, the second layer is with an, um, a kind of a letter of credit issued by a bank. And we are even looking at ways where EDRD can guarantee such a letter of credit. And we're, we're also thinking of a third layer to cover for the political risk of Lebanon. And here we're talking with MIGA, which is part of the World Bank Group. So it is really a full-fledged, complex, very detailed mechanism that we have uh, progressed on. Uh, we have been in discussions with BDL, with EDL, with the Minister of Finance, obviously together with the LCEC. Today we have it almost ready and we are uh, in a market sounding approach. So we are approaching uh, other international financial institutions uh, that also will, will be there tomorrow, we hope. We are also... Uh, we are, yeah, okay, sorry. 
We are also this way. We are also uh, approaching international developers, trying to to see to which extent this mechanism can uh, encourage them in investing in Lebanon in the future. Uh, this is the current uh, ongoing uh, phase of the project, so it is really at the at the end. And what we would like to envisage is a kind of a large all stakeholder meeting to to really to um, to test the final product, if I may say so. Having said that, what I can share with you today is the first um, feedback that we are receiving. And uh, as expected, most of the stakeholders, mainly the international developers, are saying that uh, we probably still need to see some form of reassurances on the reform implementation. Uh, because at some point we were wondering to which extent this can be done in conjunction with IMF and not after IMF. Uh, the first feedback is that uh, we are uh, uh, we need to deliver on the reform before being able to attract international developers, including with the syndicates. But I think this is very useful. I think this will indeed uh, support attracting more international developers. And you know, we, when we prepared this uh, carol together, we said that we would not talk about reform, IMF, and all of that. We talked uh, very much about it, but you know. We, we still, it's a circle, and each time this is the, the main, the main uh, big issue that comes, is the, the need for reform in IMF. Thank you, thank you, Khalil. I know you said in conjunction with an IMF or after. I was hoping you'd say prior to an IMF or after. Uh, so in all cases, there is, there is a way. Yeah. There is a way prior to IMF. Uh, and we are looking into this. But for that, we need to, as much as possible, to see the Benisk, the risk profile. And for that, we need an international developer willing to put its own skin in the game. So if we find an international developer that is happy and confident enough to put some own risk, some balance sheet risk, then we might even look at it before I Great, thank you. So, I mean, the risks that you're trying to cover are, are really multiple. It includes liquidity risks, payment risks, guaranteeing the whole uh, cost of investment uh, with the termination cost, but also the transferability of the currency, uh, the convertibility of the revenues from LBP to dollars. So all these risks are very hard to manage if you don't have the reforms and if you don't have the IMF program in place, which will help stabilize the depreciation of the lira. And I presume as well, and Matt Sogaya or Vlad are here to comment on this, that many of these instruments because some of them, again, are liquidity, others are termination guarantee, and the MIGA, which is an insurance for the convertibility, breach of contract, and others. So some of those would need laws to be passed. Correct, uh, Matt Soleya, can you comment on this? Yes, um, you, you are correct. I think uh, the ultimate aim, eventually, of the DFIs, and uh, I speak under the control of, of Khalil, is to find as many uh, forms of credit enhancement that do not require the passing to parliament. <laughs> I think that should be you know, the, the, main, the main guideline behind, uh, behind uh, their, their efforts. Um, Carol, if you allow me, I'd like to, to weigh in on the legal aspect of what Khalil was saying from a, from a credit, um, credit worthiness and uh, the credit enhancement standpoint. Um, our experience with working in, on the way DPA, which as you know, and, and, and Pierre can confirm, was used as the basis for the solid DPA because it was the first model DPA of Lebanon, was that one of the key elements that the DFIs uh, who were looking to act as lenders brought up very, very often in the context of a bankability assessment and the risk assessment was that the, the lack of a stable regulatory environment is one of the, the main issues behind the level of risk of these types of projects. And I think that this, this risk was offset by the solid efforts of LCEC, obviously a lot of other players, but mainly by their efforts in wanting to render the PPA as bankable as possible, starting with the identity of the client under the PPA. And here, I think there's a, there's a nuance that not, not many people know, which is that before 2018, 
all the agreements that involved the purchase of electricity were primarily signed by EDL. So the counterparty, the buyer, the client was EDL. So whoever was going to finance that type of agreement was taking EDL risk at large. And in 2018, with that first PPA, the identity of the client became the government of Lebanon. And EDL is acceding as an additional party to the PPA to perform specific obligations that were either of a technical nature or which were uh, entrusted to it specifically by the client, who is the, the, the government of Lebanon and who is the primary obligor for payment obligations under the PPA. Now that was great news in 2018 before whatever happened, happened. And now, <laughs> you know, the, the, the government of Lebanon uh, being the client, again, uh, became the primary problem of, of the PPA, correct? And, and so this is where we are today. Um, it's still better than having EDL as a client, but we still, and I understand uh, from Khalil, and I know from other PFIs and uh, potential sponsors that the credit enhancement of the credit worthiness of the government is a major issue, and hence uh, credit enhancements are a, a key component. Now, all the examples that were mentioned by Khalil uh, obviously need a lot of work. They require a lot of uh, legal structuring because there are no current laws that provide for that because the government of Lebanon was never in the situation it is in today. And the, some, some of these credit enhancements are provided for in the body of the PPA. Um, as you know, the, the Council of Ministers uh, awarded the 11 licenses to the unincorporated joint ventures back in uh, uh, May of 2022, and um, the, the, the solar PPA was successfully signed last week, congratulations, on, uh, on the 5th of May, with a condition, with a scheduled condition satisfaction date, which is one year, during which the parties are expected, obviously, to agree on a lot of technical stuff, but also the possible credit enhancements. And, and the, whether those get implemented or not, depend not only on the intention of, of PDL or the capacity to get uh, to, to do whatever reforms or whatever it takes to get those guarantees, but also on the ability to structure these legally in Lebanon. Yeah, on, on that actually, thank you Soraya for mentioning this, because uh, yes, we've all read in the news the signing of the 11 PPAs uh, for the 165 megawatt solar uh, first utility scale projects in Lebanon. Uh, with everything that we've said, Pierre, can you comment on the signature? What does it mean? At the end, you know, we need to see executed projects in Lebanon, and you're all frustrated. And I know not everything sits within the Ministry of Energy or the SCEC. Can you comment on the signature? What does it mean, given all these unknowns still that exist, given that the financing is probably linked still to an IMF, and with the credit worthiness issues of the government, what is the signature? What does it mean? And do you expect extensions of time again if the government doesn't uh, follow suits with the, with the reforms? Well, that practically, the signature of 11 uh, power purchase agreements, the PPAs, I think is a strong positive signal that we're moving in the right direction. As I think, this is a signal that most lenders uh, have received. And we started receiving calls since this morning from international financing institutions who are interested at least to study, to see what's happening in the city. I think EBRD is, is among those players, and we'd like to have the EBRD uh, feedback in order to upgrade and to update the PPA in order to make them as bankable as possible, like that's what I guess imagine. So the thing, I think it's a positive signal, it's a prerequisite. No financing can be uh, ensured without the signature of the PPA. This is a prerequisite, this is a milestone. And I think we're moving in, in the right direction. Now, uh, in the history of Lebanon, there are two types of PPAs that were signed. We have, in 2018, the three wind farms. Uh, we're talking about 226 megawatts, so it's in the range of around $300 million, which is um, these are big projects. And then we have, yesterday or Friday, these smaller projects. So we're talking about 11 solar farms, uh, each with a uh, capacity of 15 megawatts. So the, investment for each of these solar farms is around 10, 8 to 10 million dollars. 
So practically, I think with these specific smaller uh, investments, uh, there is an appetite from some international companies to put some equity uh, in these projects, in these small projects. And, and I think if, like I would mention the name, Total Energy has shown its interest, Qatar Energy has shown its interest, other uh, big players are showing their interest. And I think if a, an entity like Total is ready to invest in these projects at the equity level, I think this again would be another positive signal to institutions like ABRD to consider giving the remaining debt part without an IMF or I think this is our main uh, gain today to push big entities like Total, like Tata Energy to invest in these projects and hopefully this will generate a positive momentum with international bankers. And Pierre, if uh, just a follow up question on that, if Total or others come and invest in a few of those. Would you preserve the other PPAs? Because if uh, certain projects go at different speeds, okay. uh, so you would yeah, provide yeah, extensions yeah. of time because you understand the type of post situation. Yeah, but, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not a post model, just it needs an agreement between both parties, between the government of Lebanon, represented by the ministry, and the joint venture representative, mm -hmm. in order to extend this deadline. So the deadline can be extended uh, for years. We're not wishing for that. We want to see this project be implemented as soon as possible. But if we can achieve, if we can see three or four projects being constructed the soonest, that would again send another positive signal yeah. and probably would push other big entities or big businesses to jump and, and take over the remaining. I think this is where the work on the credit enhancement tools prior to an IMF may be critical to reduce some of the risks. And with that, maybe with Vahakin, uh, you work on a study which is uh, de-risking the renewable energy sector in Lebanon. And I know you've had various recommendations uh, linking as well the cost of equity. What is the return at the end that impacts the tariff? So we didn't discuss the tariff. At the end, this is on the IPPs. Uh, the, the lowest tariff is at 5.7 cents in the BK. So uh, the government is buying electricity at 5.7 cents, uh, which is today the by far the cheapest source of energy for Lebanon. Can you share with us some of those recommendations that you had in your report on how to de-risk this sector at the end to, to drive the tariff down for the country? This is the aim uh, and end goal uh, as a public service. Um, yeah, um, so, so that study was in 2018. Um, so whatever the study had said in terms of equity and that is irrelevant today. Um, and obviously at the time, the cost of the technologies were much higher. Um, and therefore, again, the results in there is, is um, you, know, well, you, you can't rely on that. Um, but you know, when, when Suraya, Pierre, and uh, Khalil were um, mentioning what, what they're doing from their side, and, you know, the different pieces of, of information that they were sharing, um, I, I quickly took notes, right? Um, so I heard, um, Something, and you also mentioned the financial risk and the currency risk, macroeconomic risk, um, political risk, grid, um, oh, you know, off takers, uh, comfort party risk, um, um, the power market risk, regulatory risk. These are the set of the de risking measures that were recommended back in 2018. Um, and this is actually happening. You know, um, it, it's in process. Um, um, Again, uh, you know, in 2018, it was the first PBA, right? So there's a lesson learned there. Uh, different technology than the solar. Now we have another PBA for, for solar. These are all elements that makes um, one of the final risks identified with the permitting risk. Um, quicker, the, the, you know, the, 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 if we move forward, the quicker, and when you have the remaining of the risks being removed or um, um, well, de-risking is not the right word, right? Uh, I think it's uh, managing risk rather than de-risking it because you can't really you know, remove the risk uh, or transferring in this case. So, you know, different elements are there. Um, um, you know, the recommendations back in 2018 in terms of, you know, a set of recommendations are, are gradually taking place um, uh, from, a, from a risk management perspective. So that's also a good sign. How long it will take, that's a larger discussion um, than just you know, looking at the set of recommendations. 
Yeah, yeah. Just from, I'd like to get your, your point of view from a private sector perspective, a Lebanese private sector company operating in the energy space. After you've heard all these comments, are you also, as a Lebanese private sector company, maybe awaiting these de-risking initiative credit enhancement tools, IMF, for you to be interested in looking to invest in these projects, which are, at the end, as a counterpart, sending to the government of the government? So yes, definitely we are looking forward. It's the only way. Uh, the more collaboration there is in place, uh, we only we all want the best for the country. And uh, whatever we can do, uh, whatever uh, is available, and whatever is to come, is the only way to move forward. But I presume as well as a as a you know at the end you have benchmarks, you have returns on investment that you need to 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 care for. So you would need similar reforms and credit enhancement tools to be able to guarantee payment on time. Pierre, can you, before I move into Khalif, because I want Khalif to get your views commercial. You're at the end, at the, you are the, a commercial bank as well. You're a development bank, but you have commercial standards uh, when you give a loan. Uh, I want to get your views on commercial on the DPA, but Pierre, before that, can you comment on the pricing structure? Is the tariff payable in dollars, or is it, given that this is a major issue right now, and EDL at the end collects in Lebanese lira? Uh, to be converted at the central bank at a specific rate. But this is a major risk, I think, and, and I think it's important that we, we talk about it and stop at it. And I'd like to get also from his entire perspective, Khalid's views. Yeah. Again, the prices in the Bika region uh, are 5.7 US cent per kilowatt-hour, and in the remaining parts of Lebanon, it's 6.27 US cent per kilowatt. And according to the decision of the Council of Ministers, uh, on the 12th of May 2022, it was clearly stated that the price would be paid at the, the, the following formula. 70% will be paid in fresh US dollar and 30% in Lebanese pound using the side of array. So this is the, uh, explicitly the decision by the Council of Ministers. Now the negotiation with uh, the company's representatives uh, it was clear that most companies will need to be paid 100% in fresh dollar. We do agree that this should be the case. However, in order to move with this formula, the 100% fresh dollar, we need to go back to the Council of Ministers and get a new decision. And I think this is what the Minister of Energy and Water will do. Because in all cases, regardless of the formula, whether it's 70, 30, or 100%, this formula will be integrated in the financial model, the financing model. So at the end of the day, it will be reflected somewhere. But it's easier for everybody because SIRA has a very volatile term. It's easier for everybody to move to 100% uh, fresh rate payment. But again, it will need a new decision by the Council of Ministers. Thank you. Have you commenting on the commercial? First of all, uh, I think this is a milestone. Uh, the 5th of, uh, of May 2023. So Mabruk, yeah, Mabruk, Lebanon on, on this. Okay, this comes with our uh, question marks, uh, but I think this is a pragmatic approach. Um, the Council of Ministers gave uh, one year to sign PPA. They are now given another year for financing. We are proceeding <coughs> to the initial plan with a lack of clarity on, on the next 12 months, that's, that's for sure. Um, what we are doing currently, actually we started with a number of colleagues here, uh, discussions of the very first PPA on, on wind. Uh, it was back in 2018. A lot has changed since uh, 2019, 2020, the default. So we need to integrate all of this in this new PPA. So the, the, uh, the ultimate objective is today to increase as much as, much as possible the bankability aspect of this PPA. And what I would like to praise in this pragmatic approach is that we understand that we will be able to review a number of topics. We will be able to review the land location. We will be able to, to include into the consortium international developers. Uh, we will be able to get back to a council of ministers when the political sequence will be there to put 100% of dollar payment. So uh, I think these are good signs. 
uh, we discussed the credit enhancement and we are currently discussing with the SEC, with developers, to also add this structure that we are working on to the PPA in its future amendments. So this also is a way to increase bankability. This is really the, the key. And uh, we will continue this support directly to the developers, directly to the FCC. The, the renewable energy potential in Lebanon remains our number one objective in the country. And we'll continue supporting this. I, and what I suggest is really to keep uh, the dialogue open with all stakeholders. Uh, we will provide as much as possible support to the current developers, locals, but also we'll try to uh, attract international developers. Uh, and it, you know, we will, it was, it's also a learning curve. At some point, these developers, when procuring for the panels, we will also guide them in this. Um, we are seeing a lot of uh, uh, issues when it comes to, sometimes to Chinese producers of panels. So uh, we believe that us, as international financial institutions, can also give guidance and recommendation in that, in that front. So it's really okay, a, On that point, because yeah. so I don't want to go through it very quickly, it's a very important point, because we're always talking about the PPA and what the government should do. But in terms of the developers, uh, trying to give them some tips or maybe hints on being prepared or having the standards that they need to get financing from the FIs, uh, definitely there's environmental studies that need to get done, etc. But also on the supplies, given that the solar energy, the most of the supplies come from China. Right, and, and you as the FIs, can you give us some color on any restrictions that you may have from financing projects whereby most of the equipment is imported from China? The, the, the biggest issue in, uh, in the uh, um, solar supply chain when, when China is involved is uh, the forced labor. So uh, we have as international community, international financial community, a kind of a common approach to, to this topic and we are uh, assessing through extensive due diligences. There is no black list or gray list or A or B list of uh, uh, manufacturers of panels or inverters, or, but there is a, a very uh, an attention from the international financial institutions in specifically in, in, that, in that part. And exactly as you said, we, we want to have a kind of uh, fully fledged collaboration and support all through the cycle of, of the <coughs> next steps. So as maybe Dalia was saying, and you are referring to the advice we could give developers and all the stakeholders that want to participate in these large-scale IPPs, is to have the dialogues, have even at the project design level, even with the Ministry of Environment, to uh, save cost at the time, uh, and, and time. And so uh, design properly from the on onset, choose well your suppliers, do the proper environmental studies as per the standards that are needed, and the other technical studies, this at the end will save the cost and time of development. I think we have an opportunity here. The fact that we're not there yet in terms of reforms, in terms of IMF, we have some time. So let's get the best use of this time to get prepared as much as possible. And you know, the, the national financial institutions, it's true that they are not providing financing today, but they are providing the support, the technical assistance that is exactly and precisely paving the way for the future. So let's keep hope on that. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll end my questions and I'll open for Q&A in a second, but I'll end it with Pierre, actually, since you're carrying the mic. Uh, the energy mix that the government had planned, and uh, the latest was actually a study prepared by EDS and the World Bank, on the submission of the World Bank for the Ministry of Energy and Water, whereby uh, many of those assumptions today may have changed. Uh, including the deployment of distributed renewable energy, in which uh, in the study we don't see much of it, uh, including the demand dynamics that have completely changed. Is it in your opinion that this study needs complete updating, uh, and uh, following which we may end up having much less the need of thermal power plant, gas fire power plants, and more maybe a bigger share for renewables in the country? Uh, the World Bank is currently reviewing this cost generation plan and the EDF uh, had prepared. Uh, and actually the results are in line with what the SEC was you know, preaching for the past uh, few years. Meaning that, again, there is one truth today. We don't need, the country doesn't need any additional power plants, at least in the next seven to 10 years. This is, I mean, I think it's becoming a fact now. Uh, the existing power plants, will need to be rehabilitated, we need to have a, you know, an overhauling 
to make them as efficient as possible. And the renewable energy, together hopefully with the wind farm and the solar farm, will definitely have a, an excess of 30% by 2030. I don't think the World Bank is currently reviewing the whole you know, modeling uh, of their study, but I do know that they are doing an update, and the scenario that they are focusing on is this one, to exceed 30% by 2030, and to, you know, to uh, neglect or, or not to construct any new power plants in the near future. Yeah, well, maybe, you know, solar is not about any more green energy or having more green energy or targets. It's it is the cheapest, so it's becoming the energy of Lebanon. And hopefully, you know, it will not be talking about 30%, but much more in the future. So I was saying that there's no doubt that the future of Lebanon will include lots of renewable energy, and solar will be a big part of it, because today it is the cheapest source of energy. Uh, and uh, and so hopefully this will help drive the cost of electricity down for Lebanon, which will only make our economy more competitive, will create job and uh, jobs and help in the decarbonization as well and the energy transition. So with that, I really want to thank my panelists for today. It was a really exciting, complimentary discussion, and uh, all the interventions were quite valuable. Uh, with that, I would uh, open the floor for Q and A, and after that, invite everybody to have uh, a drink with us uh, uh, in the next room. Exemption on the important components for the bad. This is not the issue that is coming out of the alarm, but after that, we will not have to worry about it. So, I hope there is any progress. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Ma يكون في ضرائب ولا تدفع أي مبلغ أو أي مضافة ولا أي نوع ضريبة آخر على كل المنتجات المتعلقة في موضوع الطاقة المتجددة. هلا آه انشغل بخلال الثلاث شهور السابقين مع المجلس الأعلى للجامعية لنحدد شو هن الكاتيجوريز اللي آه لازم يكون يطبق عليهم هذا المنظور لأنه بحسب الكاتيجوريز بينزل كثير أشياء هلا كارول ذكرت في الأوزان الكيلو جرام آه فكثير مواضيع بتنزل عند الكاتيجوريز سو الكاتيجوريز تحددوا القرار المشترك اللي بتتوقع من وزير الطاقه والمياه ووزير الماليه مضى عليه وزير الطاقه والمياه وارسله لوزير الماليه، هلا متوقعين يمضي وزير الماليه، باللحظه اللي يمضي عليها وزير على وزير الماليه بيتطبق وبيصير يتطبق على كل شيء وهذا كمان جزء من السياسات اللي اشتغلت عليها الحكومه اليوميه بعده مراحل اخر واحد بيجي لثانيه 22 بيير از ذات تاكس ديكري 167 ان بارتيكولار؟ نو اجين براكين نو uh, one of the exactly one of the policies was the decree 167 that was done I think in 2016-17. It was updated I think in 2019 and recently in 2022. But again, this is one single task of it. Thank you, Dr. Thank you for such a nice presentation. My name is Salim Ali. I'm a professor of public health at the UV. And I want to ask about the the uh, this investor that we never think of. The Lebanese people. Okay, the Lebanese people are a lot of people who have a thousand dollars in their pockets and are wondering if they can use them for their bettering their, their collective lives, at least those, those of us who are still here. Can we have instruments, financial instruments that are offered by whatever remains in our, in our businesses or whatever remains in, in uh, uh, entities that, that have some respectability? to bring us into this, this conversation as investors, well out at the level of, of $1,000, $2,000, so that we own this energy that is opening up in front of us. Because we do not trust the government that we have. We do not trust that if it's costly, if it's cheap, that it will remain cheap. Because they have done it in the past. They have taken some, something cheap, and because they are in control of it, they have transformed it into a way of making money that we never see. And the, the good example is the electricity now, the, the rates. Okay? 
So we want to have some, some possibility of having a, a sort of sovereign possession of this energy. And we don't want it to become also a new, a new way of creating injustice and inequity in this country. So why don't you think of us as investors, the Lebanese nation and the, the local governments, the, the municipalities? Thank you, Mr. So maybe, I don't know who wants to take this question. Pierre, you want to comment on this? Yes, sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, practically, definitely, there are a few initiatives taking place today which are based on crowdfunding. I think crowdfunding is the best financial way you know, to involve like, small investors, like the thousand dollar range. However, the most important part, which Ms. Soraya has mentioned in her intervention, is the adoption of the DRE law. If this distributed renewable energy law allows private to private sales of green electricity, of solar electricity, using the EDL network. So practically, the contracts, once this law is approved, the contracts to be signed will be between a private sector entity and another private sector entity without going through any procedure or any involvement of, of the government or, or the government institutions. So I think this could offer a nice opportunity for small investors to invest at the level of villages, at the level of communities, and this is again allowed by the DRE law. So hopefully, with the adoption of the DRE law, a new horizon will be offered for small investors. Can, can I, yes. And can I maybe mention the uh, law 462? Hopefully, once the regulator is in place and we do the unbundling of EDL, maybe some of those uh, government-owned or pub uh, public utilities can be listed on the stock exchange, so offering that's, available. That's acceptable. That's because it. then the biggest, the biggest sharks will, will buy it. And it will be privatized, and then we have no control of the rules. No, well, this, we can put some governance uh, and on uh, percentage we'll allowed that. ownership, yeah. etc. But this needs public policy design, which uh, hopefully some people will be listening to us today and taking notes on that. Yes. There's also a gentleman in the back. Who Thank you to the panelists. My name is Aram Yeritsian. I'm an architect, and I want to bring to the table the darker side of the solar panels, which is in fact the visual aspect. And so we're focused on, on policy and, and the finances, which is all of course very important, but these uh, solar panels are contributing negatively. Uh, they are causing a significant negative impact on the visual context and on the visual environment. So I want to ask about the mechanism or, or the regulatory framework that kind of can, should be implemented because I think it's not and how can we control this thing so that it doesn't result in more uh, visual chaos? I think this goes to the point where we need more collaboration between various ministries. <coughs> uh, when we talked about agriculture, when we talked about water uh, and others, because the solar energy is impacting much more than one uh, sector. And I mentioned in the intro the urban planning and the visuals that you're, you're mentioning. So I don't know, Bahak and Pierre, who wants to comment on this, or even maybe Khalil, uh, some best practices of what you've seen in other countries? Um, uh, thank you, Aram. Um, I mean, this is one of the recommendations, um, standard recommendations, um, to preserve as much as possible um, the aesthetics of, you know, of the area where you're installing those um, um, the solar farms and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's taken. Uh, but my reply would be very pragmatic. Would you rather have black smoke or an ugly view? I think in the situation we are, we should stop thinking that. And that is, I mean, Kelly was saying, you know, the issue of the you know dollar versus Lebanese and the share in PPA and so on and so forth. I mean. Even if you know the companies would be paying their income tax, national social security, and so on and so forth in Lebanese, um, it's okay if they get paid in dollars fully. You might say no, but then today we're paying ten cents per kilowatt hour um, to the electricity to consume less than hundred kilowatt hours, but then goes up to twenty seven cents per kilowatt hour. So even in this case, we were paying five point seven in dollars. You know. At the global balance, you're still making, uh, you know, benefits. So, you know, pragmatism, I think, uh, does have a role. No, sorry, I, I didn't. I'm a strong advocate of energy efficient buildings and complementary renewable energy. I'm just saying that why can't they be designed properly? They have to be there. 
And then on, on that point, uh, Pierre, isn't there a process like the permitting with the municipality of exactly. Interior? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is effectively what I wanted to mention. All permits and licenses given to residential home homeowners uh, installing solar are based on two legal milestones. One is the one mentioned by Matt Soraya, which is the all installation within the 1.5 megawatts uh, limit. They don't need any official license. The other decision, or the other milestone, is the decision by the Higher Council for Urban Planning, 132 al And this decision, with all the drawings and all the details, it man, it's, uh, dictates how all the solar systems are installed. So again, if there are any improvement that can be done to this decision 100, 132, we'll be more than happy to work together with ABUs around the all the different in order to improve and to change this decision, but the, the, the aesthetic part needs to come from your side. Uh, the decision is there, it was taken in 2019. We are very keen to implement it the way it is, and that the height is three meters for buildings that have a, a, a high building height of less than 15 meters. With so island of 15 meters, you can go up to 4.5. This is done by the High Council of Urban Planning. They are the architect. We are implementing it. So if we have any improvements, please do share it with us. We will be more than happy to work so together. So Pierre, Pierre, Pierre is, uh, his door is open to, for any suggestions. Please do send them. There's a question in the back that's uh, there, but Daria wants to make no, it. No, I just want to add on what's happening on the ground. So yeah. definitely there are panels that, on the that are on the building, and there's no sunshine on it. So which does not make sense. So let me say from from the existing as well, whenever we want to install panel, we have to check where is the best location for the customer to benefit. So it's not where, where it is nicer, but rather where would it be more efficient. So this has been restricting us. But having said that, I was really impressed with the competition we did with AP students, because the students came up with ideas for new buildings. It's not only the panels, it's the panels, the fuel tanks, the water tanks, all of that that are on the roof that today is not as nice. They came with creative solutions for all the building services. Panel is a part of it. It's not only the panels. So this is something interesting to look forward moving to new buildings, but for the existing, as they say, jude bil mawjud. So we're trying to see whatever can be done uh, for an efficient system to avoid more black smoke for now. And this is without counting the neighbors' fights and who gets to put what on where. <laughs> Hello everyone, thank you for such a fascinating talk. I speak with the audacity of a latecomer, so apologies if, uh, if the topic I'm about to mention has already been discussed. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, it's, about, it's about batteries and, and more broadly life after life, life after the, the, um, the, uh, the asset, really. Um, I was at the, uh, the uh, Solar Energy Expo, the Clean Energy Expo, I don't know if any of the panel got along to that here at, uh, at the um, the hotel that we played last week. And I was just doing a kind of informal uh, ethnographic chat with some of the, the battery manufacturers who were there. Um, and with a twinkle in their eye, I was asking them, you know, what, um, what happens to these batteries once your, your clients have finished with them? And with a twinkle in their eye, they said, oh, well, we, we just advise them to, to dispose of them somehow. Uh, Paul Pierre has had to field my questions in the past about these sorts of things. We've, we've spoken over the phone, indeed as well, but I wonder um, what what does happen to the components once they've reached the end of their of their useful life. Okay, thank you. This is definitely this is a topic that was briefly touched on on the recycling uh, of batteries and the need for a recycling policy. I don't know, Vahak and Pierre, you wanna and call out more cooperation between different uh, ministries, given that you also have lithium ion, you have lead, you have different types of batteries, and you need a policy for each. On, the, on its recycling yeah, and disposal. Uh, sure. I mean, 100%, you know, they tell you that, you know, going to dispose. Um, but also, if, um, if you ask anyone who has a, um, a car in Lebanon, what happens to the batteries that they have? It's usually the, 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 the mechanic shop that keeps it and then they sell it. And that goes back to dismantling. Obviously, I'm not saying this is a formal sector or organized way. There's some sort of um, sort of recovery, material recovery, um, that takes place. Not organized, um, probably some components are just you know, dumped in the waste stream as well, liquid and otherwise. Um, not ideal, uh, not optimal at all, uh, but yeah, as we were just pointing out that there needs to be a system. Um, 
you know, to, to, to actually bring that forward into a performance system. Um, but I'll go back again. I mean, one of the reasons I mentioned uh, your car is not only specific for your control center. So it's a wider issue um, that needs to be tackled. So maybe from this podium today, from IFI and AUB and CC, we can launch a call to government bodies to start working on a, nation, a nationwide a recycling policy because also other than the solar with batteries we're seeing lots of EV vehicles being uh, imported today that also have batteries and we're going to have to deal with this waste uh, in one way or another and this needs to be done more than the ad hoc you know I go to my uh, mechanic and I give him my old battery it needs to be organized at the nationwide otherwise we're going to have to be dealing with a bigger uh, bigger problem down the line. Hi, thank you all again. I'm going to read a couple of questions we got uh, online from the online agencies. So, uh, Joanna von Togenberg asks, what is your view on arguments that say there is a need or an opportunity to include the current generator operators and shifting towards solar in the future, given that they are already operating microgrids? So, uh, do you want to take this question? Should I? I, I no, I, I can take it actually, because in the study, uh, at the end, you know, there's always the technically sound solution and there's someone, someone, a solution that's more attuned to the public economy reality of a country. And in the latest study that we published with IFI, we energized Lebanon a month ago that I invite you all to check online, we actually proposed a new distribution model for the country because we don't believe that the government uh, in the current distribution uh, model that it's been following has been efficient in collecting uh, payments on time, uh, nor in its collection efforts in general. So we proposed a new model whereby we would have a smaller distribution companies that are private companies that buy electricity from EDL and sell it to consumer, a bit like electricity exactly without having the ability to generate. And we believe this model could include some private generators as potential owners of these companies, given that they've had experience on the ground in selling electricity to consumer and collecting. And this could be an idea to be debated at the policy level. Because at the end, not only there's an issue to be faced with them on the ground, but also they employ about, uh, they have a huge task force. I don't know what the number was, but Pierre may have it, 7,000, 10,000 families live from these private generators. So we do have to deal with that. Uh, being more on a pragmatic approach, and so uh, the distribution could be a, a good, a good part with the ability to generate solar electricity with the DRE load. So. Especially the battery is not going to take solar generator. Especially that the solar is not a replacement for the generator, because again, if you want to replace the generator, you need batteries, and the prices are still high. So there, there will also was be need for a generator, but it will be less. You need a solution at the government level to replace yeah, the generator. Yeah, so there will always be a need of a generator, so it would be good to have them on board. Uh, honestly, the, the, the answer to the question is the honestly no. Uh, <laughs> so again, no generators are an illegal setup and they should not uh, continue in, in, in this regard. So the thing is, why it's, it's a no? Because practically, it's extremely unhealthy to have two layers of distribution networks to the one above the other. Today we have the legal network, which is the EDL network, which is your national electricity utility network. And we have the an overlap, which are the illegal generators. It's extremely unhealthy to have an overlap of two networks. The good thing is to strengthen the existing national network, and then using this network, we can go as decentralized as, as needed. So this is, I think, the, the healthy approach that this considers. This is the, force, the spirit of the law forcing through. This is the spirit of the DRE law. You are using the existing national network, and within this structure, let's go decentralized. As, as I think as that well. was the idea, and to have a competitive tender for decentralized companies, which would be open to qualified and uh, uh, companies like the private generators that can pass KYC compliance and other requirements and that pay taxes and costs when they use uh, any government assets. Um, uh, we have another question, so from the nouns and the... Sorry. Okay. Uh, what are the return expectations of solar developers given the country and other risks discussed today? The return, uh, the return requirements. Maybe we can mention the ones prior to the crisis, and uh, maybe uh, Khalid, you can give your views on uh, on today. What are developers asking for in Lebanon? Uh, do, do
you have no no honestly we 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 we're not we're not there yet uh, even you know uh, the the current prices that we have described um, today I I believe that uh, with the ongoing uh, discussion these are also meant to to potentially fluctuate so it's too early but definitely this is a very uh, profitable business otherwise we won't see that much interest from international developers but to give a figure. For the Lebanese case, it would be, I think, a little bit premature today. Maybe I can give the color prior to the crisis, and I, the, the study behind it that you had also provided had a 16% required return. It was around those levels prior to the crisis. Best in class, I remember, had was 7%, and that was a 40-year study with the NDP. With, with various, once you start adding the various risks of Lebanon, this uh, resulted in a required return of 16% prior to the crisis, which has a direct impact at the end on the tariff that the government has to pay. So the more we can de-risk and reduce those layers of risk, the more we can reduce the cost on all Lebanese of electricity and on the economy. That's why everything we're mentioning is so important today on the de-risking and the credit enhancement. And to go and support as well what Khalid is saying, you cannot price what's unpriceable today. The current risks are too high to put a price on it. Uh, and so definitely, once you have the credit enhancements in place, uh, the returns required will, be, will come closer to what we had, in uh, my opinion, prior to the crisis. We have two big unknowns. We have two big unknowns today, the cost of financing and the cost of risk. Without these two costs, without knowing the exact detail of this cost, because we cannot talk about any other at this time. Hi, I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to thank you guys for the discussion. It was an interesting discussion. I have a question for Suraya. Um, we were talking. We were talking about how uh, you're advising for uh, this model of renewable energy leasing, which is what you were talking about, and how these private companies would go on private properties and then they would uh, and they would install solar and then there would be this like monthly rate. So I know from law 462 that they allow a private generation for up to 1.5 megawatts, uh, sorry, uh, megawatts, uh, but uh, and I know the technical report for the DRG law talks about renewable energy leasing. So, this, so when you talk about loopholes, do you mean uh, the private sector or the public has figured out a way to do renewable energy power leasing without a DRG law? Is that what's happening? And yeah. it, would be, it would be interesting if you could explain how this loophole works. Uh, yeah, I believe you did, but uh, this is for clarification. So and I have a second question after it. Sure. How about you ask me that second question? Because oh, we're question. running out of time, so yes. Suraya will have two minutes to answer okay. you. Uh, the second question is actually not to Suraya, it's to uh, Pierre. So, how does the new uh, PPA project for solar compare to that of Hawakka? So, basically, my question is uh, what, what are our expectations for these? Uh, 15 companies, uh, basically, that's it. Okay. So there are more great questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that one. Um, yeah, because we've recently done a, done a comparative study between the two uh, the two PPAs, so, uh, but I'm sure you know, Pierre is a always better place to answer that. Um, on, on the first question, it's not, you know, it, it's not a loophole, as, as Carol said, it's a workaround. Um, and uh, it, because it's not, there's no loophole in the law, they just didn't provide for it in the first place. So it's not a mistake, it was an intentional non-provision of, of that solution. Um, but once, once the DRE uh, law is enacted, then you won't need, or at least you'll be covered by the law when you're doing these types of mechanisms. And today, uh, the way this works, as, as I described and in answering the, the previous question, was that, is that a, a company enters into a contract with a private party to install solar panels on that private party's private property again, and to, to handle everything up to, you know, linking to, to all the household items, etc. And uh, against a fee. And that fee structure varies from contract to contract. And <coughs> the contract itself is structured as a lease to own, whereby eventually at the end of the contract, sometimes it's 20 years, 15 years, etc., uh, the, the owner of the property where the assets were installed becomes also the owner of the panels. 
So that's really as much as, as But it's limited to 1.5 megawatts. Yes, still. of course. So it's within the limitations of the rule. It's not a work around even the, the rule so. on the capacity. Uh, Pierre, can you briefly, but just really briefly, because we're out of time, I didn't get the, question. the difference between uh, the wind farms and the solar farms? There are no major differences. To be honest, there are no major differences. The only difference is that the level of the technical detail, whatever applies to wind, doesn't necessarily apply to solar and vice versa. Meaning the technical part of the EPA, because definitely they need to change because solar is different than wind. But other than that, I think that it's very much the same. Exactly, pretty much the same EPA format. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for those that were watching us on Zoom. Thank you for the attendees. I, uh, for a small reception, and uh, again, thank you to the panelists for an exciting talk. <laughs>